The Doom of the Haunted Opera by John Belairs and Brad Strickland, Chapter 12. Jonathan Barnevelt had just finished brushing his teeth when he heard Mrs. Zimmerman call him from her room. He went down the hall and found the door open. Mrs. Zimmerman was sitting at her window knitting a purple scarf and listening to the national news on the radio. Outside, the sunny Florida sky was blue and cloudless, but Mrs. Zimmerman was frowning. What is it, Hagface? asked Jonathan in a teasing voice. As with a frown, Mrs. Zimmerman shushed him. Listen, she said, just before the commercial, the announcer said a news story about New Zebedee was coming up. The radio was playing the last few bars of an Epona toothpaste commercial. When it was over, the newscast continued. A genial and good-natured voice said, Has anyone found a small Michigan town because the United States Post Office and some other people are looking for one? According to the Post Office, its delivery trucks have not been able to find a town called New Zebedee for days now. Local farmers also report difficulty in getting to New Zebedee, and they blame their problems on an unseasonable fog. Better watch out if the post office can manage to lose a whole town. Just think what it could do with those tax refund checks. The announcer went on to another news story. Mrs. Zimmerman put down her knitting and switched off the radio. I think, she said, it is time for us to go home. For once, Jonathan did not tease her. He nodded and said, I'll go call the airport, get packed, we'll fly to Detroit on the first flight on the first available flight. Jonathan, asked Mrs. Zimmerman. Yes, Florence. Do you think the children are all right? I was just going to call, Jonathan hurried away. He and Mrs. Zimmerman had already settled Lucius Mickleberry's estate, and they had planned to leave for home in two days. Three wooden crates held Mr. Mickleberry's books of magic and collection of amulets, and these were ready to be shipped back to New Zebedee. Jonathan then tried long distance, only to be told the lines to New Zebedee had not been open for days. He called the airport, and after that a freight company, then he hurried back to Mrs. Zimmerman's room. She had pulled the window shade down and had closed the drapes. Her black umbrella was clasped in front of her, and the golf ball-sized crystal orb that formed part of the handle glowed purple. The light shifted and pulsed, casting weird patterns that flowed and fluttered over the walls and over Mrs. Zimmerman's face. It looked like the flickering light seen underwater through a diving mask. Mrs. Zimmerman sighed, and the glimmer faded. Anything? asked Jonathan as Mrs. Zimmerman stood up and opened the curtains in the window shade. Nothing, she said. Now I'm really worried. I don't often use the crystal as a scrying ball, but when I do, it never fails. If it can't show me new Zebedee, there must be some kind of magical barrier across the town. She opened the closet and took out her big suitcase, which she tossed on the bed. She opened it and began to take articles of clothing from drawers and pack them. <clears throat> what did you find out? Not much, Jonathan told her, and he explained that the phones were out. I don't like the sound of that, Mrs. Zimmerman said. Did you call the airport? We've just missed the last flight today. There's a plane at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning that stops in Atlanta, Louisville, and Detroit, replied Jonathan. It will get us to Detroit by 4 in the afternoon. We should be able to get to New Zebedee late tomorrow. Mrs. Zimmerman had been folding a purple sweater. She put it in the suitcase and looked at Jonathan with haunted eyes. I wish I knew what we will find there. All Jonathan could do was shiver. That very night, Rosarita and Lewis crouched uncomfortably inside the doorway of the farmer's seed and feed. Mrs. Jagger was at her house trying to come up with a magic spell that might help them thwart or delay Vanderhelm's plan. Lewis and Rosarita were going to try to throw a monkey wrench into the works of the theater. Huddling in the cold doorway, they heard the distant sounds of music and many voices joined together in song, often interrupted by long periods of silence. During one of these pauses, Rosarita whispered, I guess old Vanderhelm is giving them directions. Lewis did not reply. Finally, about ten o'clock, people left in groups of three and four, some humming, some chatting together, a few silent. They saw Mrs. Holtz and Rosarita's mother go by. When no one else came out, the two friends slipped out from their hiding place. Rosarita tried the doorknob. It's locked, she said. Come on. Or it's unlocked, she said. Come on. A dim light burned at the head of the stairs. Lewis followed Rosarita, his pulse drumming wildly. The smell of fresh paint filled the air. And when they stepped out on, into the vestibule of the theater, Lewis gasped at the change that had taken place. The overhead lights burned, showing that the walls had been freshly painted, the thick carpet thoroughly cleaned, and the whole place tidied up. It wasn't nearly as dilapidated and forbidding as it had been on their first visit. Rosarita hurried to the auditorium. It's dark in here, she announced. Let's see if we can find the lights. They searched for quite a while before Lewis had the idea 
of going into the coat check alcove. A doorway there led into a small booth with a window that looked out into the darkened auditorium. A single dim bulb burned here, illuminating a control panel covered with switches. That must be the light booth, said Lewis. But which of these do we throw? Try them all, Rosarita replied. She reached for the nearest switch and pulled it down. Immediately, a rose-colored light bathed the right part of the stage. Lewis threw some switches, and more stage lights came on. Finally, he noticed one large switch off to the left. A label below it said, HOUSE, in capital letters. When he tried the switch, a chandelier high over the auditorium came on, and in its light, Lewis could see the rows of seats, newly cleaned and mended. Okay, said Rosarita, let's see what we can do. They went into the cavernous auditorium. Lewis's fresh crawl flesh crawled with distaste and fear. The place looked clean and neat, but it had a sinister atmosphere as if someone were watching their every move. Suddenly, something occurred to Lewis. Hey, he said in a hoarse whisper, did you see him? See who? asked Rose Rita in an, ir in an irritable voice. They had reached the stage, on which a series of backdrops depicted a small town. In the orchestra pit below, the brass instruments gleamed. Surprisingly, a scattering of sheet music lay over the floor of the pit, as if the musicians had just carelessly tossed down their music when they had finished rehearsing. See who? asked Rose Rita again, glancing around. I don't know who you mean. Vanderhelm, returned Lewis. We saw about half the town come out of the building, but I didn't notice Vanderhelm, did you? He was probably in one of the groups, said Rosarita with a shrug. Hey, I've got an idea. Let's get all this music together and burn it. I'd like to, I'd like to see them try to do an opera with no music. Lewis hesitated. He remembered only too well the last time he had gone down into the orchestra pit, but Rosarita was already descending the steps. Lewis gritted his teeth and followed. I don't like this place, he whispered. Rosarita put her hands on her hips. Well, we won't be here long. What a mess. Here, help me. Stooping, she whooshed. Stooping, she reached for a handful of music, and Lewis bent to do the same. Whoosh! A wind sprang up from nowhere, making Rosarita shriek in alarm, and Lewis leaped backward. He stumbled against the steps and sat down hard on the second one from the bottom. Rosarita backed toward him, the wind whipping her long hair all around her face. The sheet music rose up in the air a cloud of papers billowing up, then spinning into a whirlwind. It rustled and fluttered and it set, as it settled into a cone of madly swirling paper as tall as a man. Let's go, said Rose Rita, yanking Lewis to his feet. She ran up the stairs, pulling Lewis, who stumbled up backward, unable to tear his gaze away from the amazing sight. The gusting sheet music grew more compact and took the shape of a man. Then it was a man, a man made of paper, with a paper cloak billowing behind him, long paper arms reaching out toward Lewis, and a blank paper face turned blindly toward him. Its paper legs rustled as the incredible apparition took a step, and then the ink that made up the music notes flowed together into patterns of black and white. The paper man became a sketch of Vanderhelm. The black eyes glared, the black lips sneered, and at the ends of the tubular arms, the ink flowed into long grasping fingers. Another step, and the creature took on the colors of life. And the lips moved as Vanderhelm's voice boomed out. Foolish children, I warned you once, and you get no second warning. The creature's strong hand closed on Lewis's flailing wrist. From the top of the stairs, Rosarita tugged Lewis's shoulder, trying to drag him out into the auditorium. Vanderhelm, or the thing that looked like him, yanked harder. Lewis felt himself being pulled downward. Run, Rosarita, he shrieked at the top of his lungs. Powerful hands clamped onto him, and he, for, and he almost fainted. He heard Rosarita's voice as if from a long way off. I'll get help, Lewis. The hands lifted Lewis clear off the ground. The creature that had taken Vanderhelm's form was incredibly strong. Lewis dangled in its grasp like a rag doll. He thought he would die from sheer terror. The cruel eyes looked into his. I must not shed blood before the ritual is complete, muttered Vanderhelm, so you may live for a little while. What to do with you in the meantime? He paused, a crafty expression on his face. Well, why not? He muttered at last. They never found the other one, the one my master hid away all those years ago, the one who caused trouble like you, yes. I think that would be most fitting. Lewis gasped as Vanderhelm tucked him under one arm and strode up the steps into the auditorium. They went backstage where only a little light seeped through and everything was dark and gloomy.
You may be interested, my fine young friend, to know that this theater has a special trap door right here at the back of the stage. It leads down into a small pit that is quite soundproof, so you will be unable to hear the performance tomorrow night. A pity, but that no one in the audience will be able to hear your screams. The creature stooped and slipped a finger into what looked like a, a knot hole in the wood. Then, with a tug, it lifted the trap door. Enjoy your brief stay, cried Vanderhelm's voice. And Lewis yelped as he tumbled down. He hit hard with a jolt that left him breathless, his chest heaving. He scrambled to his feet. Two feet overhead, the oblong of dim light narrowed as the trap door swung downward. Lewis gasped for a, for a long breath and frantically tore at his muffler. He threw one end of it, just as the door was about to shut. Lewis tugged. The muffler was caught. Part of it must be sticking out of the trap door. Would Vanderhelm see it? After a long minute, Lewis concluded that he hadn't. But what good would it do him unless someone came looking? Someone like Rose Rita or Mrs. Jagger? That was exactly what Lewis was hoping for. It was the kind of wish that Mrs. Zimmerman always called a forlorn hope. Now he knew what she meant by that. The air was close and musty. The darkness complete. Lewis felt around. He seemed to be in a kind of well with rough brick walls. It was about four feet square and maybe seven feet deep. He shuffled around and caught his foot in something that made a dull clatter. Lewis stooped carefully and fumbled in the corner, feeling for whatever had snagged his foot. Something rattled under his touch, like fragments of broken porcelain. His fingers ran over curved shapes, smooth and cool to the touch, and something that was like a hard round ball. Then he felt the teeth. Lewis screamed in terror. Now he knew where the ghost had come from. He had found the final resting place of poor Mordecai Finster. And that is the end of chapter 12.